On my channel, I've showcased a wide variety of budget PC hardware, from high-end components from previous generations to parts you can literally pick up with some spare change. However, I haven't yet built a system that truly captures the essence of what my channel is all about. So today, I want to put together an ultra-budget gaming PC that represents what you can do for as low of a cost as possible. To do this, I'm giving myself a budget of just $100. It's not a lot to work with, and most definitely won't fund a system capable of playing the latest and greatest titles, but you might be surprised what you can put together for such a low cost. If you're someone who just likes to play esports style games, or just wants to run a few older 7th and 8th generation console releases, $100 might be a stepping stone towards joining the gaming PC master race. In addition to working with the tight budget, I want to build something that's realistic and somewhat repeatable to put together at a similar cost. From my experience, the best way to do this is by starting with a used OEM pre-built PC and upgrading it for gaming purposes. Mass-produced office computers like Dell Optiplexes, HP Elite Desk, and Lenovo Think Centers are widely available on sites like eBay. However, choosing the right one can feel overwhelming. There are many different sizes and form factors, hardware generations, confusing naming schemes, and even unclear specs in the listings. The key things to look for are the CPU model, along with whether the system includes memory and storage, as it can be convenient to get those bundled together. For gaming, I typically recommend sticking to slightly newer pre-built systems with at least 8th or 9th generation Intel CPUs, but with our tight budget, that's not feasible. Another important thing to consider is the form factor of the system you choose. For my purposes, I generally look at either mini towers or small form factor systems. Mini towers offer greater compatibility for upgrades like more DIMM slots for memory, larger power supplies, and room for full-size GPUs. On the other hand, SFF systems tend to be cheaper but come with size constraints and slightly less upgradability. There are plenty of routes that we could take, but I ultimately chose to go with a bare-bones Dell Optiplex 3020 small form factor for just $30 including shipping. While it didn't come with a CPU, RAM, or storage, it does give us a CPU cooler, motherboard, case, and power supply to work with. The system supports Intel Haswell processors, which are some of the cheapest and most widely available CPUs out there. The best options for this build would be something like an i7-4790 or i7-4770, but they still hold enough value that they're out of reach for our budget. A quad-core Haswell i5 would be another good option, but as you'll see, they also don't quite fit within our budget after a few other key purchases. I ended up going with the i3-4130, a chip which I already had on hand, but one that's available for just $5 on eBay. I also managed to snag a more powerful processor that unlocks significantly better performance, but I'll share more on that later. For now, the i3-4130, a dual-core CPU with four threads, will definitely impose some tight limitations on the performance our build can achieve. For system memory, I always aim for at least 16GB. Even in less demanding games, 8GB of RAM can be a serious bottleneck. And fortunately, DDR3 is pretty easy to find these days for on the cheap. I ended up getting a 16GB kit of HyperX Fury DDR3 for just $20, including shipping. You can find cheaper OEM kits from China for a few dollars less, and they'll perform just as well, but I wanted this particular RAM with the nicer heat spreaders for another project down the line. For storage, a SATA SSD is essential for any ultra-budget build like this. Running Windows on a traditional spinning HDD can be a headache, and some games simply won't perform well on them. The most cost-effective solution would usually be pairing a smaller 128GB or 256GB SSD for the OS with a large, cheap HDD for additional storage. However, for this build, I opted for a single SSD since I found a good deal on a 512GB Levin drive on Amazon for $27. It should offer good boot times, a snappy Windows 10 experience, and plenty of space for the types of games that this lower-end system can handle. No gaming PC would be complete without a graphics card. Unfortunately, the $18 budget really narrows down our options. Thankfully, single-slot, low-profile cards that fit into our SFF system are often the cheapest available. For this build, I chose the NVIDIA Quadro K620, which I featured in a video a few months ago and is one of my favorite dirt-cheap budget components. At around $15, it's surprisingly capable. In my previous testing, when paired with a more powerful CPU than the i3 we have here, the K620 was able to run many games in 1080p with playable frame rates. I also have an alternative GPU, and when combined with that mystery CPU I mentioned earlier, it will push us over the $100 budget. However, this combo might deliver a much more impressive performance, so stick around to see the results. 
One underrated aspect of assembling a gaming PC using a pre-build is that most of the work is already done for you. Occasionally, some additional cleaning or dusting may be necessary. In my situation, all I needed to do was install my components and apply some thermal compound to the CPU before getting that cooler locked down. After installing Windows 10 and drivers, it was time to test out a few games to see what our $100 system could handle. It's crucial to keep expectations in check for a build this cheap, especially when it comes to gaming. The main goal here is to get it running some less demanding titles at playable frame rates and see how far we can push this ultra budget setup. First up, I tested Counter Strike 2. A recurring theme in these tests is the significant CPU bottleneck caused by the i3. In this case, using a higher resolution to shift more of the load onto the K620 GPU actually works in our favor, leading to a more stable performance. At 1080p with the low preset and FSR set to performance, I averaged around 55 FPS in a Dust 2 practice match. While there were a few noticeable dips, overall it looked good enough and ran smoothly for casual gaming. GTA 5 at 1080p with the lowest graphic settings and FXAA ran surprisingly well. While lowering the settings this much made some textures and vegetation look soft, the game still averaged 56 FPS. Depending on the environment, either the CPU, GPU, or both are running at or near their maximum capacity. But for a system at this price point, the performance is solid and I really can't find much to complain about here. In Skyrim, another older but timeless game, I set the graphics to the low preset with FXAA enabled at 1080p. While exploring in and around the Whiterun area, I consistently saw frame rates between 40 and 50 FPS with an average of 48 FPS. This is a perfectly playable result and it's close enough to the 60 FPS cap that many players likely wouldn't notice the difference during regular gameplay. Next, I tested Fortnite using the performance API at 1080p. The settings that I settled on were medium view distance, low textures, and low meshes. After pushing through some major stutters early on, the game averaged just over 60 FPS during a match. It wasn't the most stable experience, with quite a few harsh frame drops and stutters, but I could still see someone being able to enjoy the game this way despite the variability. Lastly, I wanted to run a slightly newer AAA game to see how the $100 system would handle it. In Cyberpunk 2077, I knew I would be pushing past the reasonable limits for our system. I ran it at 1080p with the low settings and FSR upscaling set to the ultra performance mode. The graphical output was pretty horrendous and I only achieved an average of just under 20 FPS around Night City. After seeing these results, I can confidently say that while the $100 budget system is incredibly affordable, it comes with some significant drawbacks. I wouldn't recommend building something this cheap in most cases. However, as I mentioned earlier, I did pick up some alternative components that could be a better option for really low-end gaming. To upgrade the i3 CPU, I picked up an Intel Xeon E3 1241v3. There are a lot of these Haswell Xeons like this one with 4 cores and 8 threads, and I got mine for around $15. From what I understand, the overall performance of many of these Xeons in gaming is fairly comparable to the i7 processors from the same generations, but at less of a cost. For the GPU, I chose the Radeon Pro WX3100. I bought mine for $25 a few months ago, though they typically go for around $30 to $35 now. The standout feature of the WX3100 is its 4GB of GDDR5 video memory. In terms of performance, it should be slightly more capable overall than the Quadro K620. With this processor and graphics card combo, I went back and tested the same games as before. This time I focused on upping the settings a little while also trying to achieve better frame data overall. In CS2, switching to the medium preset at 1080p, I averaged 82 FPS and consistently hit the desired GPU bottleneck. There were one or two significant stutters early in the match, but nothing noticeable after that. In GTA 5 at 1080p with all settings on high, which are technically the medium options for this game, the system delivered a solid 60 FPS. While the previous CPU and GPU handled the game decently, it's nice to see the jump in visual quality with this setup. In Skyrim, we went from 1080p low to the high settings with TAA. The average frame rate was very similar being in the mid 40s for the majority of the test run. Fortnite showed the most noticeable improvement in 1080p performance mode with epic view distance, high textures, and low meshes. The system averaged a much smoother 90 FPS, though with similar instability overall. Still, this was a significant jump, especially considering the increase in settings. 
Lastly, Cyberpunk 2077 ran about 10 FPS higher at the same settings I tested previously, with an average of around 30 FPS. While this may be borderline playable for some, a drop to 900p is probably all it would take to get a lax 60 FPS. After testing the Optiplex with the upgraded internals, I was quite impressed with the performance boost. For around $120, it offers significantly better price to performance than the first CPU and GPU I used. That said, I think a build like this appeals to a specific type of user. If you're mainly interested in playing games like Minecraft, GTA V, Fortnite, and other popular easy to run titles, spending around $100 on a system like this can be an excellent way to game on an extreme budget, then maybe upgrade to something down the line if needed. If you're someone who wants to dive into a wider variety of PC games and programs, I'd recommend saving up a bit more, maybe around $300 to $400, and investing in a more capable custom PC with an upgrade path. It's a smarter long-term approach if you're working with a budget but want something that can handle more demanding tasks and games right now. As for today's video, it was a fun challenge to put together a system for such a low cost. Personally, it's always a bit surprising to see just how functional the cheapest, lowest end PC hardware can still be in some cases. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Also, if you have any questions, video suggestions, or budget PC building tips to share, feel free to leave a comment. Thank you.